thank you all so much for coming tonight. And um, Mary Jo, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you here. Well, sweet of you to say, I've really enjoyed getting to know Bobby. She's fantastic. Any of you ever get to have a drink with her or something, I say, take, take the chance. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to start off with um, where you were at. Um, very you had a very interesting career path before you got interested in editing. You worked in public interest in Ohio politics, and you were a graduate student in English at Ohio State. Yes, and I taught all the time that I was a graduate student there to fund my graduate education. So. I mean, I so really was the, the world champion of graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> I was there for about 10 years. And then you said you got into editing by accident. Yes, by accident. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was working as uh, one of Robert Redford's assistants, and I wanted to do something on one of his movies. And so I don't know even how this came about, but he and I guess Mark Johnson, the producer, decided that I should work in extras casting on The Natural. So. That's what I did, and I, it was the, I don't know if any of you have seen it, it's a baseball movie, and I worked on casting the local baseball players. It was really fun, because I was the only person in the department who knew anything about baseball. So I would go around to all these local teams and like, think, oh, that guy's, his arm is pretty good, and, you know, and bring these guys back for Barry Levinson to consider and cast um, in the movie. It was very fun. Uh, but I knew casting wasn't really for me. And then one day I was walking past, I guess it was actually on The Ordinary People, I was walking past a cutting room, and there was a room with women in there. And there was, this is 1980 when Ordinary People was uh, being filmed, and there really just were not very many women, period, unless you were a script supervisor or a makeup person. Not very many people in the film business, but I had walked by this cutting room and seen these women in there, and I kind of, I said, hey, what are you guys doing? <laughs> and they said, oh, well, we're the assistant editors. And that really is my, that was the first time that I just thought, well, this is something women can do. So I'm going to find out what it is. And that got me started. And I really think a seminal moment for you was when you were an apprentice editor for Dee Dee Allen on Milagro Beanfield War, Definitely. which Robert Redford drew. Exactly. That was also courtesy of Redford. For yeah. Sure. Um, can you talk about, well, there were two things that really struck me about this story is, um, and this is a very smart move for all you editors who want to <laughs> achieve success, <laughs> is it was Christmas break. Christmas break, but Dee Dee didn't want to take a break. She's totally, well, was totally devoted to her work when when she was working. So she didn't want to take a Christmas break, but everybody else wanted to. So I said, being an apprentice, and being an apprentice, you never get to be in the room with the editor. But I said, well, I'll stay and assist you, and then everybody else can have a uh, Christmas break. So that was kind of my first exposure to assisting and what it was like once you got in the room. And she did have a stream of consciousness. She would just talk the whole time she was cutting. Half of it I didn't understand, because some of it was about her family. <laughs> You know, and I had to kind of figure out, now she's talking about the movie, now she's talking about her, her niece, or you know, whatever. But uh, it was a great experience, you know, and it, it, it made me start to really understand what editors do, I think. And you said there was a moment in that movie, in the kitchen with... Yes, with um, Julie Carmen, I remember. They were cutting a scene that was, I think it was an argument between... Um, Joe Mondragon, who is the lead, the guy that plants the bean field, and his wife. And she just came across this shot, and I remember her saying, this look, this is a great look. And she showed, the, showed me the look in the moviola screen. She was cutting on a moviola. And she said, this look is important, because even though they're having the argument, the way that she looks at him right here, this shows that, they've got a, that she loves him, and this is a solid marriage. And, and I remember how she kind of tried to build the scene around this look, and it uh, was really interesting to see how it came together. Because I feel that when you talk about your process, it's very similar to the way you work, that you don't have this sort of structural, I know how I'm going to start this. You, I don't. You search for moments, and you try to find an organic way to build the scene. And Well, there's definitely a, uh, an example of that in the Super 8 clip that I'm going to yeah. show. And, and I, I, I do want to point it out. I, I think, it, I know I know that, I think I talked to Gordon about it once in an interview, but um, it's just a little thing, but I just loved it. It, was, it made the, 
it made the kids and what they were doing and their lack of sureness so real to me. And so maybe we'll point it out when we get there. But I also just want to touch on, you said that actually studying English literature helped you as an editor. Can you Very elaborate so. on that? Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that, you know, you'll be sick of hearing this phrase by the end of the evening, but a point of view is something that I think is incredibly important in editing. And uh, fiction, I mean, I studied a lot of 19th century fiction and a lot of early 20th century fiction when I was in grad school. And a point of view is incredibly important in all of that. And also just, you know, you talk, when you're in a fiction class, you talk about character all the time. And so that is obviously a huge part of what we do as editors. We're trying to shape character. Um, and just, just the, the way of thinking about the arc of a, a story or the arc of a novel. Um, you know, the, what, what the character's beginning point is and what his end point is, or hers. Um, so all of those things that were just ingrained in me as a way to think about a story just really ended up being so helpful when I got into the editing room. I, I still, in some ways, I think like an English student yeah. sometimes. I mean, it's fantastic. I, also, you talked about, I love when you talk about the um, experiencing something through a character's eyes rather than being an omniscient narrator. Right, right. And that's really, it, we'll show an example yeah, of that too, or more than one example, but you know, you, the deeper meanings of things, and you're really a deep thinker, and you know, it's so interesting because this whole thing about typecasting editors, actors get typecast too, I guess. Um, but, you know, you've done a lot of action films and you're yes. a woman. <laughs> wow, what a concept. <laughs> but you've experienced some pushback for that. Um, you were talking about an interview you right. did. I, I actually, this, I think this was, I, I don't know, it doesn't seem possible. I think it was after Star Wars came out and kind of in the middle of this conversation with this guy because the way I'm talking to you guys is how I am. I'm not, I, I'm not a huge personality. I'm just kind of down to earth and normal. And, and in the middle of this interview, this fellow says to me, "All that action in those J.J. Abrams movies, you cut that." And I don't know. I just felt I feel like I wasn't coming across as like big enough or you know strong enough or crazy enough or something. But it was very weird. I just feel like. I don't know if it's being a woman or not being loud or I don't know whatever. He but it's but it's also interesting because if you think about the bet what you the way you talk about cutting action and and being involved with the characters and and there is if you want to put it in a category of fe me male and female sensibilities sort of a hybrid and that's what makes a scene work is is, well, is the emotional investment and all right. that. Right. I mean another clip that I brought today that I want to talk about today is actually that the character should I mean that action should be character driven as well that it should be a conversation it should be it should be like a dialogue scene in a way that they are through their action they're they're showing their character and they are they are communicating with one another. Yeah, so, it, um, so I w just wanted to say that um, I thought it was interesting too when you kind of hit the ground running. I think it was your second film and you, d you had to, I mean, we're gonna show other examples of this where you really had to manipulate footage in a very creative way, Marietta and Ecstasy. <laughs> it was your second film, you had done a buddy comedy and this was, Second. Yes, it was. It was only my second film, and it was a it was a film that took place in a convent. Um, John Bailey, the cinematographer, was the director of the film, um, and he had, he had directed one other time. But uh, at one point, the producer, the head, the studio head, said the film was was designed. The script was designed to be a flashback thing where a series of nuns were being questioned about this young novitiate in the, in the uh, convent, some of whom thought was a charlatan and some of whom, whom thought was a saint. And so it was a series of interviews with this special priest that's been sent in to question everybody and see what's going on here. And then all of a sudden, the studio decided that they didn't want it to be a series of, of um, interviews. They wanted it to be just a narrative movie. <laughs> And I just like, first I was totally freaked out and then I just sat down and I started trying to figure it out. And it was, for a second job, it was kind of an amazing experience because 
by using some dialogue over some shots and I don't know, I just discovered that it was actually possible to do it. And it, I mean, the only thing that saved me was that it was taking place in a convent and they never changed their wardrobes. That <laughs> absolutely would not have been able to do it if it hadn't been for that. But it was absolutely a fascinating exercise. And, and then working with J.J. Abrams as long as I have, when we, when we worked on Alias, that was kind of the first, I, we really had to get into rethinking scenes and, and mi the missions and, and Alias were always so complicated because she was a double agent and so, <laughs> I don't know, I, you'd get to the end of one of them and you'd look at each other and you'd just like, I don't know what just happened, I don't know what the plan was, do you know what the <laughs> plan was? <laughs> and so we really took, we did so much rewriting in the, in the cutting room on Alias that I really, it's just second nature in me now. Like as soon as I see something that I feel isn't working, I, my wheels start turning, and I just start thinking, "Well, we could take that out, could add a line there." <laughs> you know, um, you know, it it comes in handy. It was a great training ground. I this mean. is fantastic. And you said sometimes when you were cutting those sequences, they made sense while you were cutting them, but then you would look at them and say, "Oh well, no, yeah, absolutely." When 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 you're cutting it and you're just going beat by beat, you think, "Oh, this is fine. It's all going to make sense." But when you put everything together, and a lot of times it's just that they're more they're written. The writer thinks he has to has to explain everything, and I don't really think the writer does have to explain everything. And I mean. I, I got stuff here to show. <laughs> <laughs> but also, um, so you you said the, the beauty of partly of uh, on Alias that you did have luxury, this is considered a luxury, I guess, in TV. You had four days. They used to give us four days. Also on Felicity. They did. And Felicity. We and had four days. Yeah. Is, so you never get four days. I don't know. And you also was... It was, was this the first time you really... Uh, part of the style of the show was a slow, half slow motion, half... Um, or, oh, the slow, slow motion, motion thing. Stuff. Yeah, I don't. Well, see, I never had done episodic television before. I did Felicity. I had just had done these series of. No, like, I mean, I, or was it Alias? Or you? No, I, the first thing I did was episode, uh, episodic yeah. TV was Felicity. Right. No, but I'm saying on Alias was it a stylistic thing you did with slow motion? Well, she had that. We actually had mixed um, uh, 24 frame and slow motion in in Felicity. Too. Oh, okay. We used it there too. Oh, okay. But and yeah, it, it's a, it's interesting how. You kind of, I kind of got used to it, and at first I would just think, oh, these aren't going to work in the same scene, but they, they kind of do sometimes. Yeah. More, more in Alias, I guess, in the same scene. But in Felicity, we would have her like maybe walking down a hallway playing voiceover or something over it. Yeah. So you, you were talking about in, in Alias with, where the, she'd jump across the chasm or something in this sort of hyper-real thing so right. you could absorb all the information. Right. Interesting. And just try to try to make it a little jazzy or yeah. whatever. <laughs> But, but it's also, I mean, this is going to come up actually when we show the first clip about what you have to, we're going to show a clip from Lost, um, the very beginning of Lost, which is kind of <laughs> amazing. But um, you were talking about style, and style for the sake of style is not something you, any smart editor believes in. <laughs> um, I don't really go for things very often just because they're like a cool cut or something. It's not really me. I don't know. I think they're... It it's, can be totally cool, and I know that, but I don't like I don't like editing that calls attention to itself so much. So, do you want to talk about how you approached the very beginning of this incredible series? <laughs> <laughs> well, I they were filming in Hawaii, and I was the only one that was in Los Angeles cutting, and um, you know I got the dailies for this opening section and. Um, the very first shot I, is obviously meant to be Jack's eye opening, and it just kind of gave me this idea that I was going to cut everything from his point of view, everything in that opening sequence, because there were plenty of ways I could have cut it, but that I was going to really try to stay true to being in Jack's point of view, to the point that I, I really wanted the audience, it's a very visceral sequence, and I really wanted the viewer to feel like they were having Jack's experience as he was having it. So my plan was to not cut to anything unless Jack took us there. Um, and then, I know you're talking about there is a, a kind of an abrupt change in style, although still all from Jack's point of view, but the opening where he, he's actually been unconscious, we assume, and he's probably in medical shock. He is completely 
um, confused and probably still just coming to consciousness about where he is and what's happening. Um, he stands up, he puts his hand in his pocket and he sees the little um, bottle, from a, a liquor bottle from an air, the kind of thing that you get on an airplane. And it kind of starts bringing things back to him. But it's still long, single, link, long shots until we finally get to the actual crash slide, and then the cutting changes, the cutting style changes, and I'm sure it'll be very obvious to you, but it changes to shorter pieces, more pieces, there are line crosses, jump cuts, changes in screen direction, and it actually isn't, isn't kind of cutting I normally do, but it seemed right here because it's no longer orderly. What's happening to him is no longer orderly. It's chaotic. He's completely um, disoriented and he doesn't know where to look. And so I'm trying to create that sense in the viewer that you don't know where to look either, there's so much going on. But always trying to stay with him. There are two breaks in point of view in it, I'm sure you'll spot them, but let's take a look at it. Yeah, we had very little time. I, I think it was about 10 days from the day they finished shooting to we had to turn it over to, to um, not the network, but the studio. But it was also, you said you, you were so up to you were you were actually cutting and he was at calling you or asking you how things were going and you were get making changes and you were because this was his this was JJ Abrams kind of I can I can do a feature that's what I th I mean it was, it's a two like hour an pilot audition. and yeah. I don't think it needed to be a two hour pilot I really do think he was letting Hollywood know that he could direct a movie um, which I think it shows that he could <laughs> you know and but so but but so it was a, for both of you yeah. kind of. Both of you proving yourself in some ways in a beautiful kind of collaboration. Yeah, it was really, we had a really good time on it because he would just, every time that he was waiting for a shot to set up, he would call and ask me what I was cutting and I would tell him how I was doing it. And, you know, I mean, a couple of times I was, you know, I was sort of suggesting, on, even on the phone, kind of big changes in scenes, like the losing the whole middle part of a scene. And, and when I would, I mean, he knew it was going to be too long. And when I would explain why, a lot of the times, you know, then he sort of never even saw the the original way it was meant to shoot. I mean, meant to meant to play. It it needed it though. I mean, but you also, I mean, you were out there, and the choices you made, even in this clip. I mean, it, the it's beautifully done, but you definitely <laughs> were. I mean, the crossing line and the and the the handheld stuff. I mean, so visceral and beautiful. But you just kind of did your. You just felt. I did yeah, it. I, I did. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's you know you have to bring. You do have to bring your own ideas and your own taste to, to things if you're really going to offer the director something. I, I do believe that. I mean, I, I don't know how much it flies. I think it's getting to be less and less that they're really interested in your input. input. I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but I still think you have to offer, you know, do your best to offer your best and not just try to second guess what, what the guys looking for, or the, or the director, or even the audience. Or yeah, yeah. Please yourself. I think you have to. I yeah. think you have to make something that you think works. It's the most important thing, because if you don't have, if you don't have your own taste to go on, you really don't have anything to go on, because you can't know what's in somebody else's head. You know, you can yeah. only go on your own instinct. Good advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is Mission Impossible Three. <laughs> so this was interesting because you really wanted this job, but you, they, I think they wanted a action, a well-known action well, editor. Well, it was JJ's first movie, and I assumed that there was no way that I would get the job because they would probably want to put him with a really experienced action feature director. Um, and I was, you know, I hate to say it, and. Don't do this. But I was timid. <laughs> I was timid about, even though I'd worked with him, you know, for at that point probably six or seven years. I was timid about asking for the job. And this colleague of mine and good friend um, said to me, you know, if you don't, <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm gonna slap you silly if you don't tell him that you want to cut this this movie. And so I just realized that, you know, he was right and I was wrong. And and I just said to him one day, you know, I. I'm sure you have a lot of people in line, but I, you know, on Mission Impossible, if you need some help in the cutting room, I, I just know I could do it. And all he said was, oh, I know you could do it. <laughs> that was kind of the end of it. And then later on, I heard that I had this meeting with Paula Wagner, who was Tom Cruise's assistant and the head of his production company at the time. 
And? And then when I get there, who's in the meeting with her, it turns out that her editing consultant is Dee Dee yeah. Allen. Allen. <laughs> so that <laughs> Christmas break thing yeah. you did, and she, I love what she said. Yeah, she, I don't know, you know, I, I think that Paula and Tom were kind of inclined to give JJ what he wanted, but I remember Dee Dee said to her, and I don't think this is an idea that is particularly prevalent or as prevalent. I remember Dee Dee saying to Paula, oh, you, oh you, have to give, you have to give a director the editor they want. It's just, it's too a, important uh, a relationship. You, you have to let them work with the person they want to work with. And it was just awesome. You know, it was just, she, just, she just like spread out the red but carpet for us by saying that. <laughs> I want to just rewind for a minute because there's something I wanted to bring up. Um, so when you were first starting out, you tried, you were very determined very determined and uh, very hardworking, and all your blue collar Midwestern yep. values <laughs> came into play. You said you looked to work with editors that gave assistants opportunities to cut. You were determined to just cut as much on your own as you could. And I, I'm going to quote you because I love this. You said, and then you took six months off because you. Well, from I, being an assistant. Uh, yeah, I felt like I had to stop taking assistant work because believe me, I could have, I, I had all the assistant offers I could possibly <laughs> handle and I just felt like I can't keep taking these jobs because I'm never going to make editor if I keep taking assistant jobs. And I know you, you know, you do what you have to do. But you said, you know, it was very uncomfortable, you had to push yourself and then you said, I made myself an editor because I refused to be denied. I would not give up. And I just want to say that I've interviewed almost 70 editors now, and their paths are all completely different. But there's two things they all have in common, is that they were so hungry to cut whatever they, whenever they could, and they um, would not give up. They had this belief in themselves and this determination, and even though luck and timing do play a part, you just increase your odds by being that person. And it, every one of them tells that story. So I just. And honestly, I think that in a way, determination is more important than talent in, mm -hmm. in terms of getting the job. It's just, I know so many really, really talented people that kind of were, were thwarted too easily by the industry. And the industry will thwart you. I mean, I made so many phone calls that you know, I could have <laughs> crept into a little corner after <laughs> what, what was said to me. Most people are nice, but some people would just sort of say, well, you know, I'm sure you probably, I'm sure you probably could do it, but I got so many people on my roster that have more experience than you, and you know, what could I say to that? But I just kept making the calls. And also, yeah, and also this thing of getting as much experience under your belt, just whatever you can give me, give me something, because then when the opportunity knocks, you're, you're, you're ready, and right. that's the other part of it. And you can cut Marietta in ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, so back to Mission Possible 3. This is a really interesting um, about the clip we're going to show. Right, it's actually, it's the beginning. I, I doubt that a lot of people saw this. It was not, I don't think it was the best received of the MI3, uh, of the Mission Impossibles, but this also directly followed the couch jumping incident, so it didn't get very much play, but <laughs> I, have to, I happen to think it's a very fun, a fun, fun one. And this is the very beginning of the movie, but it is a flash forward into the movie. It's kind of a, a technique that JJ's used before of the, just putting something at the beginning of the movie that draws you in and makes you kind of feel like, well, I, I want to get to that point. I want to see what's going on there. So here it is, the opening of the movie. So you said a colleague said it was too long. Yes, uh, you know, I had a co-editor on it and we get along great really and I'm, we are, we are really good friends, but I remember she said, well, that's too long. I'm gonna try this version where, I want to try it where, we just, you know, it's just faster and snappier. It's the opening of the movie. And she did try that, and it was just, it wasn't anywhere near as intense to, to m lose the headings on those, on those things where you see him rain, rain himself back from the fury because he knows it's going to be a disaster if he stays there. Where you see him, like, looking from, from um, Phil Hoffman to uh, Monaghan. What's her name? I can't remember. Michelle, thank you. Michelle Monaghan, like looking back and forth, trying to figure out what the, wh wh where do I go from here? Yeah, like, 
reasoning with him isn't working, pretending to be his buddy like I want to help you isn't working, pretending confidence that I know what it is that he's looking for and where he's and where it is. And like all of these strategies, they're just not working. And I mean, we find out later, well, I'm not going to tell you in case one of you actually sees it sometimes. <laughs> but it, no, but it's, it's more terrifying, too. And like you said, you're, you're so with him because you can imagine yourself in right. that position and saying, and then, y you get, then you get overwhelmed and you get angry and then you have to calm yourself down <laughs> and all those different, and, and it's, it's the countdown doesn't have the same, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, the ticking clock is, is a lot Time of Time is interesting. Like you can think making something shorter makes it, that would actually make it feel longer to me because it would be, wouldn't be as interesting. It's just not as compelling. It's not, it, yeah. No. It's just an interesting example of um, you have to really be in the character. Um, I mean, it, it really, I think that's why people watch, in my opinion, people watch things, especially television, much more for the characters to see what the characters are up to from week to week than to see what the plot is from week to week. And it, I think once characters stop making sense, it's easy to disengage from them. Then I, I think it's kind of a disaster, really. Like once they start acting in a way that doesn't make sense to you, doesn't seem psychologically or emotionally uh, real, it's very easy to start disengaging. And uh, you know, uh, our feeling like, that has always been that even you know, if the character is on, on another planet and you know, running around having a gun battle with no uh, air tank, you know, <laughs> I mean, uh, it doesn't matter how unreal the situation is, they're, they're emotional and, and psychological behavior still should make sense, no matter what the, what the situation is. And when you, you said from the beginning when you were working with J.J. Abrams that you had a shared sensibility and that he was very much, it's all about the peeps. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, I don't think I would have, it wouldn't have worked out for us to work together as long as we have if, if we had, didn't share that, you know. Yeah. Um, so um, I'd also like to talk, because this is now the first feature that you um, co-edited with Mary Ann Brandon. And, um, I think it's very interesting how you collaborate because um, I think I don't think it's that common, and I, it, it, there are a lot of, especially big movies like that, that have multiple editors. And can you describe how you do this? Break it up. Break yeah, up the word. Yeah, our method is really different. I don't. I don't know. Well, actually, I think that because they, a lot of editors will yes. trade scenes back and forth. Yes, you know I, I think um, there are maybe a couple that don't, but. Um, we don't trade scenes back and forth at all. Uh, we split up the movie at the beginning. We try to take pretty pretty big chunks of the movie. And I, like on, uh, actually, on Star Wars, we only w there were three pieces. I took the beginning, she took a long middle, and I took the end. Um, but we we all once we kind of gone through the movie with JJ, we all comment and we all work together about what should be done. But we don't. But we still maintain ownership of the piece of, of our section as far as making the changes go, and it just works better for me that way. Well, it just makes more sense because you're invested in that, and there's a through line of your of your your work, and that you're sti you're in that place and. Also, for the director, he doesn't have to bounce back and forth <laughs> like you do this scene. Oh, now I go in this cutting room and this cutting room, and I just, I just think it's really great. It's not a checkerboard thing, but it's an emotional journey. Right. Um, the other thing that's kind of unusual is that you don't run first cut. No, we do not. Which I think I've actually mentioned this to a couple of other directors who leaped right on this concept. Um, and this is really this really came from JJ. He doesn't run a first cut because he thinks it's demoralizing. And, and it is. And it is. <laughs> He's one hundred percent. It's really demoral. It's never what you think it's going to be. It doesn't matter how hard I've worked on it. And I, I they play. It's not that they don't play, but really, what the director is reacting to is not your work, and it's really not even whether the movie's going to work or not. He's reacting to his own disappointments about certain th shots that he didn't get or you know, things that he thought were gonna play that are not playing and it's just, it's kind of a disaster. So we just start working on scenes. You know, and it's, and not, not even necessarily at the beginning, although on Star Wars we did. Um, he'll just like maybe pick a scene that he was kind of worried about and work on that, you know, or just pick something. And, and just spend like two, two weeks or a month on, with one editor and mm -hmm. then go, 
Yeah, and go then back and forth. And then, but also, if you're not vomiting and in shock, you and you run it when it's been refined, you can actually see the overall. And and uh, directors are just too freaked out. <laughs> they really um, are. But so so then what happens? So then you work goes back and forth, works with each of you, and now you run the three. Then of you. we then we cut. Well, actually, it depends. Uh, like um, on that next clip that I was going to go into, I actually have a story about that. That on Star Trek, the first time we ran it, it was. Marianne and me and JJ and Matt Reeves, who was the co-creator of Felicity. Um, you know, it depends on if it's just us or if he wants to, usually has maybe one or two trusted people that he wants to have join, but it's not a big group, that's for sure. Yeah. So, um, and then you, then you go back and you just work on your own sections. Well, we try to figure out what needs to be done. Right, you talk. It, we yeah. talk about it, and we try to figure out what needs to be done. But then we do make the changes in our own sections. And just I uh, want to also talk about specifically what you do. You are, I mean, this is maybe also a Dee Dee Allen influence. She, you said she obsessively watched dailies, and you know because she's looking for the nuggets and yeah. the little gestures and the moments. And you run dailies with Marianne, but then you run them again. I, wa I run them again for myself before I. Um, it's really great to run them with Marianne because we, first of all, it's just fun to talk about the material. And she'll comment on something that I didn't particularly think about. And I'll come on, I mean, I'm t I tend to be m much more about meaning and performance, and she tends to be much more about the camera. And it's good for me to be hearing what she's saying about the camera and all of that. And it's good for her to hear what I'm saying about what is that supposed to mean? <laughs> you know, I mean, because we need to figure this stuff out before we start cutting. Right. Um, and, and, and then I really do, I look at them again for myself before I start cutting. I have to. And you take uh, old school notes. I do. I take old school notes. I, I take notes about sounds that I think I'm going to need. You know, um, like, like, because, you know, there's such great production sound effects. I, I'll take notes about that. I'll just take notes about uh, just a look or a particular line reading that I just think is really great. Even if I don't like the, perf the, the take overall, I'll note the line reading because if it's particularly good, I may end up using that in whatever take I use. I may try to fit that line reading into the actor's mouth. You know, I just take a lot of notes. Sometimes something an actor does makes me see, see the scene and it, it makes me reinterpret what a moment means. That's like the DDL thing. <laughs> it, it really is. I don't know, it just really can be so yeah. enlightening. I wish, I know, I think it's Carol. I've heard somebody else watches the dillies after they've cut the scene too, which I think would be fantastic, but I don't have time for all of that. I, um, I do if I'm really stuck on a scene. I know, I can't tell you, you know, like the, the Han, um, uh, Kylo Ren, that, in that scene in um, Star Wars, I probably watched that, those dailies four times, five times, all the way through. Um, the Kirk death scene in Star Trek Into Darkness, I watch those daily. I mean, the things that are really delicate where you just really have to wring everything out of them that you can, I'll, I'll definitely obsessively watch those. Um, just when I'm having a hard time, I, that's the only place to go because that's all you've got. Well, that and your rewriting abilities. But it's also always a smart thing to let the material guide you rather than having a preconceived notion of how you're going to start a scene or anything. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we're going to talk about the screening of, you said you were screening Star Trek with... Right, right. Well, w I should set up the clip maybe first. Okay. We'll watch, we'll, we should watch the clip, but um, it's, I don't know how many of you saw, saw that first Star Trek, the reboot, but um, the idea is that Kirk has a character arc in it, sort of um, charming, but jerk um, to uh, co extremely cocky to character who is you know still has some growing to do but is mature enough and responsible enough to cap to captain the enterprise um, and it was you know I mean okay so the, the opening this clip at the opening of it the night before he has met this Captain Pike, who we see briefly at the beginning of the scene, he crosses him and he says, four years, I'm gonna do it in three. That's his new mentor. And then he's getting onto the ship to go to Starfleet. Captain Pike has talked him into joining Starfleet Academy. And he's getting on the ship to go off to Starfleet with all the other cadets that are on board. But and previous to that, there was a scene in a b bar mm -hmm. where he meets uh, Uhura, oh, Uhura, right. And right. 
This is a female sensibility thing, so. Well, that's not what we're showing. I, I know, but it, it, it also, it's, it's just before this, but also I like what you had to say because it's part of the character arc of his. You know? Right, he was, um, JJ really directed him to be a jerk and, and to, to, to really, he wanted him to like go out on a limb. And it was a good idea, but when we watched the first cut, <laughs> I remember Matt Reeves, looked at me and he said, Kirk is a jerk. I can't stand him. <laughs> and we just really had kind of gone overboard. And um, there was a particularly this bar scene where he meets Uhura for the first time. And JJ had really changed my cut a lot. He just kept saying, no, you're, you're making him too appealing. He should be really an idiot. But my argument was, well, Uhura is continuing to talk to him. And if I were in a bar and this guy who's talking to me is, is just acting like such a jerk. I'm not going to continue the conversation. I'm, <laughs> he's got to be charming or she is not going to continue to talk to him. So we went back and forth, but he, I just didn't win the day on that one. And he, <laughs> I, I just felt like he kind of ruined the scene. I don't know. But it turned out very, very, very near when we were locking the movie. I said to him something like, so you're happy with this bar scene, right? And he said, oh, I don't know. Because he kept making it shorter, and it wasn't fun, and she wasn't fun, and Kirk wasn't fun, and he kind of said, Let, let's just look at that old cut that you had. And so we pulled it out and kind of ended up going with the old cut where he's, he's a little bit of a jerk, but at least he's kind of cute about it and but charming about it. He makes fun of it. himself. Yeah, he does make fun of himself, and that's, it, Chris does a really good job of that, yeah. I think. He always is, his, his self-effacing humor, which is, there's a little bit of it in this clip, I think is always... It's always a good move for him. He does well on that front. So. so you went and you went through the whole movie and made him. Well, I had to do that. We had to do that. Um, let me let me go into that a little okay. bit after we talk about. Okay. It. So he is definitely a fish out of water. The moment that he we see first of all we do see that total transition, right? He's cocky as hell outside with Pike bragging about how he's going to complete the Starfleet Academy course in three years, and then the minute he steps onto that to that shuttle and sees everybody else. We see the smile fade and the discomfort. He almost puts it on like an overcoat. Um, and then hits his head, he's embarrassed by that. And then he's seeing everybody else in uniform. He gets a little more uncomfortable. He sits down, he's struggling with that seat restraint and he has to kind of, he notices that the guy sitting next to him is looking at him. He gives him that kind of sheepish smile. And then he looks over and realizes that Uhura has probably seen all of this. Now I had footage, it was, it was a matter of point of view for me again, that I want to stay with his experience. I had footage of Uhura noticing him the moment he got on the shuttle. And I remember, not JJ, but somebody else on the show said, why aren't you showing Uhura? You know, it would be so much fun to, more fun to know that she was watching him the whole time. And I just said, you know, I would never cut it that way because it's, an, it's taking the omniscient point of view. It's so much more fun to see him go through all these uncomfortable steps. And then the cherry on top of the cupcake is realizing that Uhura was watching the whole time and probably saw all these things. And, but yet he sort of makes fun of himself and, and you know, has that, has that kind of giggle about the fact that, that he realizes that she was there. And then what you were referring to was, again, this whole issue of trying to make, after our first cut, realizing that we needed to make Kirk more likable, more accessible. Um, in that scene between him and Leonard, when they're sitting, uh, at Carl Urban, but the character of McCoy. Um, he had played it pretty remote. He played it closed off, and he played it, uh, he didn't look at him, he didn't engage with him. And that was how it was played, or I had played it in my first cut, because that was mostly how he played it. But after I realized, after we had this whole we realized that he just wasn't playing well in the first cut. I went through scene by scene and tried to figure out in each scene, what can I do to warm him up, make him more likable, make him more accessible? And in that scene, I realized that I had a few takes where he actually looked at him. He, you know, he actually engaged with him, paid him some kind of respect, gave him some eye contact, and that was, that was all I could do, really. But it really changed 
how you perceive him, especially because he looks at him when he starts talking about his divorce. It feels like he's on the personal matter. He's he's actually willing to give him some attention, and it really it, it did that in a lot of sen- scenes, and it, it helped a lot. So you said you went through the whole movie and did that, and and it is so subtle, but it it's there. It helps a lot. Yeah. yeah. It's so interesting. It's a, it's a really in- interesting exercise to do if any of you ever get to do that. Just sit down with a film and with the dailies and, s- and see how you can change a character. Like, uh, uh, this guy's the, our hero, but what if I would decide to make him a little bit of a, a hero with a dark side or something, just to see if it's possible. And, and being a good listener, an empathetic listener, yeah, is right. really interesting. It, it, makes it, it makes a person better. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now we're going to talk about Super 8, very different film. Um, S- Stranger Things, and uh, I, think it, I think it inspired Stranger Things. Um, but also, you know, it was a, I mean, it was um, a sort of tribute to the Spielberg movies, Goonies. and Right. But this lovely thing where the kids are the heroes and kind of misunderstood, the, the grown-ups are kind of out of it. <laughs> and, the, right. and this, this uh, I mean, it's also, of course, the... What? Supernatural stuff and everything. Um, it kind of it, it kind of um, owes a debt to the Blob. I don't know if you guys have oh ever yeah. seen that. You know where it's Steve McQueen. It's like in the fifties or right. I think it's one of Steve McQueen's first movies where he and a bunch of teenagers are running around town trying to get the adults to believe them that they've seen the Blob and it's coming for everyone and the adults won't believe them. And it's kind of the same thing happens to these kids in this movie, but. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's about a group of kids that want to make their own. They're, they're trying to spend the summer making their own Super 8 movie. And there's this little chubby kid, Charles, who's the director and kind of the bossiest guy in the group. And then there's little Joe, the dark haired, cute faced boy who's got a terrible crush on Alice, who's the Elle Fanning character. And so at the beginning of the movie, they're waiting to catch their ride. They're going out to the train station. They've all sneaked out of the house, and they're going out to the train station. to. They want to film a, a scene out there at night. And I think the other thing that you kind of have to know to understand the clip is that Joe, our little hero boy, uh, his mother has died about six months previous to this. She died in a mill accident, and Alice's father also works at the mill. It's not he didn't cause And that the comes up in this scene. It comes up in this scene. There'll be a moment that you won't get if you don't know that. But the other thing is just in terms of finding nuggets and finding here you had mostly except for Elle Fanning, mostly inexperienced young actors. Yeah. And yeah. Just the beauty of their naturalism and their the truth <laughs> and and I, I was so aware when I watched your editing about just those little beats. They make the scene. Um, so they're adorable. The kids are adorable. The Martin, the taller kid, the one that has kind of kind of has the lead in the movie. Yeah. And he's also the dim one. He's slightly he never quite understands. Like he's asking Charles questions about the script in the beginning of the scene. He had some experience, but the other three I don't really think had any. And they were all actually in love with her. So <laughs> they're so cute. You, when you watch this, you just you m- really made the most of that. So we can run the clip. Thank you. I just love those kids. <laughs> <laughs> but just those beats where you see Joe's love for her or the awkwardness and the improv of the guys oh, the fighting over the script or the guy on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> you just found all this beautiful stuff. Well, those kids did improv. Some, there was a lot to choose from when, with uh, Martin and Charles talking about the script over there, but they did improv some of that stuff, and it was hilarious <laughs> what they were doing. I had so much to choose from. Um, yeah, they're just, I mean, and really, I just wanted to show that. It is, uh, Joe is our hero, but he has a lot of people to, com- to compete with, and most of them are funnier and bigger than he is, because he's just, he's the sweet boy, and then there's the, the kid with the fireworks, and the bossy director, and the dim kid, you know, and um, so I, I did really want to, even though there are definitely breaks in the point of view, I did really want to keep it in his head. And I, I had, did have those great shots, like the shot of him behind Alice in the car, just looking at her and just enjoying her, being thrilled to be near her. And then there's that one shot of him looking, which I kind of had to fight for, looking and l- kind of laughing after Charles said, geez, I'm just trying to direct. You know, he's just enjoying his buddy. He's just enjoying seeing him do his thing. and tried to use those kind of shots to keep it kind of in his head. 
And then you put it together quickly, because JJ asked you to, and you asked for six shots, <laughs> and one of them was, yeah, he, they were going to strike the set, and he asked me to, to try to put that, I hadn't even started on the scene, he would asked me to put the scene um, together over a weekend and let him know if I thought he needed any more shots. Um, and one of the shots I asked for was that shot of Charles coming directly up to camera screaming, production value. <laughs> Is he, he did have the moment, but he didn't have him running right up to camera like that. And I just thought it would be so much funnier if, it, if he just like went for it. <laughs> so he got it. See, the editors should be asked that question. <laughs> um, we're going to move on to Star Trek. Into Darkness, um, this 2013, and um, this was a bear of a sequence. Um, it was part of the problem, too. Wasn't it way, like $2 million over budget? The special effects people said you had to cut it down. And oh, that was a different sequence. Oh, that, that, was a different that was a sequence at the beginning of, <laughs> I think I oh, told you this. Oh, that's another bear. That was okay. Another, that was another sequence but at the beginning of it. this was something that was very difficult. And yeah, they wanted him to cut this down too, the sequence down too, but he didn't want to do it. And then of course we ended up having to take tons of stuff out of it. But I understand it's not, I mean, it's always that way in a, in a film. And I understand like feeling like he felt like he needed all those pieces in order to make a choice about how it should be. So this is a, a battle on a planet. Um, Kirk, Spock, and Uhura are on a secret mission, and there are a couple of red shirts with them. Um, they're on a secret mission to this planet. There's a terrorist who had attacked Starfleet headquarters, and he killed a lot of pe people, and one of the people that he killed is Kirk's beloved mentor, Captain Pike. So Kirk is bent on revenge, and he has begged for the chance to go on this mission to bring this guy back and face justice. Um, the problem with the mission is that the, plan the planet that they're heading to, Kronos, is in the Klingon home world area. And Starfleet's not supposed to go there because it could start a Klingon war and it's just really off limits. But he's begged for and gotten permission to go there and just do this, you know, um, I'm trying to think of the term. What, what do they call it in the in military? This sort of like. Mil like a, a military like s strike to just go in, grab him, come out. And also it's supposed to be an unpopulated area, so they're not expecting any trouble. Um, but of course, at the beginning of the clip, uh, they have run into trouble. Um, so, and this is one, this is basically a sequence that uh, we rewrote a lot. We rewrote, a, we, we rewrote Uhura's dialogue. She goes out to deal with the Klingons because she's the one that speaks Klingon and they al agree to let her give her plan a try. And then we also rewrote the action. But I, I guess I'll explain that, how we rewrote it after you see, that, see it. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So first of all, there was a person that was an expert in oh. Klingon. Amazing, amazing. So I'm gonna, just for fun, I'm gonna read you what was what Uhura was scripted to say when she actually went out to talk to the big scary Klingon. So her, her dialogue was, who's in charge? And he said, silence, human. You will answer my questions. How do you know our language? And then she said, my lover taught me. And he said, you have laid with a Klingon? <laughs> and she says, until he stole from me, now he hides in the ruins of this city, a coward. I have come to find him and take back what is mine. Then the big scary Klingon grabs her face and says, you lie. And then she says, then kill me. At least I will die with honor. And then during this dialogue, there were, Kirk has that line, this isn't going to work or something, but there were more cutaways to Kirk being very negative and saying, they're, they're going to kill her, this isn't going to work. Um, and then spurred by the, the the scary face grab, he came rushing and just like flying out of the jump ship with guns blazing and then the other guys that are inside the jump ship, Spock and the red shirts and uh, figure, okay, and they come flying out of the jump ship. So they're the ones that actually, in this scripted version, the first cut, initiate the gun battle. Well, I, I don't know, it, seem, it should seem as no surprise that that didn't seem like it was working because there, for me, there were two things that logically just didn't make character sense. I, to see Uhura walking up and saying who's, I mean, it's all, it's all, it was all 
uh, subtitle, but this idea that she would out there and be so, go out there and be so challenging and uh, like who's in charge and this tiny woman. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's again, it's one of these cases of a character doing something that just doesn't feel like it makes emotional sense. And then we have Kirk in the middle of this thing, kind of just um, undermining her and thinking that he can save her when obviously she would be the first one to die if he did that. So it just felt like it's, it was going to have to change. And there is this amazing guy, and God knows he deserves to have his name mentioned, but I, I don't remember it. It was like five years ago. But he's, I think he might have invented the Klingon language, and if not, he's definitely an expert in the Klingon language. Once we decided what it was that she was going to say and that they were going to say, I gave him all the pieces of film where they talk, um, and I said what, they, this, what we wanted them to say, and he came up with Klingon dialogue could kind of fit in their mouth that had the general m meaning of what we wanted them to say. And it was, it was truly remarkable. And then he, he coached um, uh, Zoe and the guy that was playing the, Kl the Klingon, um, sort of how to say it and how to pronounce it. I'm sure he ha they had help the first time, uh, too. And we actually were able to have them say Klingon dialogue that approximates the meaning of the, the new subtitles that we created. It was just, you know, it's kind of like a lucky break, like the, the, the women in the, in the habits in the convent. I mean, if they'd been speaking <laughs> English, I don't know what we would have done. But fortunately, they were speaking Klingon, and we could, um, we could change the meaning of what they were saying. And then the other thing we did was to have Benedict Cumberbatch start the shooting instead of Kirk. And that was a, it was too late to, we really did not, uh, get new visual effects or new shots or anything. It was basically a matter of repurposing the shots that we already had. And I just kind of, I like I kind of re just reimagining the scene. Like if I were shooting it as if this had been the original, you know, this, the original idea for the scene, what are the pieces I would be looking for? Well, I'd be looking for a piece where he shot screen, screen right. And then I would be looking for a piece where the Klingons react, the guys inside the shuttle react, and Uhura reacts. And like, oh, there are a lot of shots where people, like she, there are a couple of shots where she glances over her shoulder. They were really supposed to be shots of her looking at the guys flying out of the, out of the shuttle, guns blazing. But she's kind of looking in the right direction, so I used them for shots of her looking over at, at Benedict shooting. And, it just, it, it's just kind of amazing. You just, I just kind of went through and pick and choose everything that I w might need. And then at a certain point, like by the time Benedict jumps off the, that platform up there, everything's kind of back to the way it was anyway, so. But you also said it was an unusually short fight because you had the license because he's a su superior being. Right, right. He is it's supposed to be in, uh, superior in intellect. Obviously, he's physically superior, that jump that he makes. And also, the, the whole sequence was just way too long. They had, the, as, as originally scripted, like Kirk had a couple of different fights. He got captured, he got away, he got captured again. Uhura had a fight, where she, like a hand-to-hand -hand combat fight with a Klingon. Spock saved her. Spock neck pinched a couple of guys. We saw both of the red shirts get taken out. I mean, it just went on and on. And then there was the moment where the 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 Klingon has his his foot on Kirk's neck. Ended up th th then then this whole circle ensued where the guys that had captured Uhura. And um, Spock brought them to this circle, and all the Klingons got around, and they started arguing about whether they should kill them or take them back to their masters so their masters could kill them. And <laughs> it just, uh, and then, and that was actually when Benedict started shooting at that moment. And he, that shot where that guy who's got it, who's in front of Kirk, gets taken out, and you see the body get, get broken in half, and you see the, the embers on the, the lower half of his body. Somehow it just worked that we were able to when he first we, we were able to go from when he first put his foot on Kirk's neck. It's probably not even the same Klingon, but that that then he it looks like he got taken out immediately. Where in fact there was probably ten minutes that we took out, not ten minutes, five five minutes that we took out right there, just to simplify and um, 
you know, and streamline. Yeah, and it's also the balance in the movie. Where right. You have to always find the, the dialogue scenes or the intimate scenes and the battle scenes, and they can't go on too long, and you're, you're very good at doing that in these films. You have to, you, you have, have to, to, yeah. yeah. So we're going to talk about a little-known film called Star Wars, <laughs> The Force Awakens. <laughs> um, and uh, first of all, I was curious, um, were you... How intimidating was that, the legacy of Star Wars? And, and of course, keeping scripts secret was not new to you because no. you had been doing this all this for all a long time. Yeah. Yes. But how did you, what was that like for you? Was that? Well, Star Wars isn't sacred to me like it is to some people. Yeah. But I did feel a responsibility because I feel a tremendous loyalty to JJ and I knew how much it meant to him. But the idea that I couldn't, I didn't have this feeling of I can't let the fans down because I'm not, I wasn't a Star Wars kid and right. all of that. Um, yeah, I just wasn't, I was into other things. But uh, I definitely felt it for him. I knew that it was, it was sacred to him. It was what made him want to be a filmmaker. And yeah. you know, and I, I felt that. Yeah. I felt that a lot. And in terms of stylistic stuff, I mean, the wipes were um, about the only. He, yeah, yeah, he just wanted to, he wanted to pay homage to the originals with those wipes, and they were kind of fun. And you said they were good. Sometimes they were pre pre planned, but sometimes they were. Um, yeah, we just, yeah, we just sort of looked for places where it seemed like a transition from here to there would be kind of cool. Like if a character was walking across the screen, the screen, a lot of times, you know, that that wipe from left to right might be good there. Or it just kind of depended on what the image was. Well, we tried to find things that looked like they fit the moment, the and shot. And you use quite a few swish pans and part half swish pans. Right? Yeah, yeah, he loves those. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so the other thing I thought, just before we get into specifics, I think it's interesting in general in terms of your value system, um, that you don't, don't do use a lot of previs, um, and because it's, again, it's, it's, he tries to shoot as much practical as he can, but even if there are visual effects, you can always ask for a post viz or you can mm -hmm. put a card in, but you really are operating from ground zero is the actors and the, and the. Yeah, oh, it, it would be okay with me if they prevised. <laughs> but that, I'm saying but that was, you, know, you said he felt hemmed in by yeah, it. Yeah, he doesn't like it. He feels, yeah. he feels controlled by it and that, that then the producers are looking for him to get shot number three and shot number 13 and shot number 16 today and, he, uh, it, even when we used a previous, he would end up changing everything anyway. So a lot of time and energy is put into working out a previs that ends up, it kind of ends up being a bone for the studio to munch on, but not something that he finds that helpful. And so yeah. he doesn't, some things he does, a lot of stuff he doesn't previs. But you know, for you as an editor, you really have to use your, I mean, you do you anyway do. in special effects movies, but you really have to use your imagination in terms of pacing and all that. And sometimes you can't even figure out what a shot is. You know, if it's, yeah. I mean, sometimes you really, you get in this green screen or blue screen shot and it's like, on, if you had previs, you could maybe figure out what it's supposed to be for, and sometimes you just really can't. But then there's always somebody to ask. And, and then you had this, the whole evolution where you spent hours with visual effects reviews and you get animatics, it's, it becomes right. more elaborate, and then it becomes easier. But at first... It's a lot of yeah. times it's just a card, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, and we're going to focus on the, the second, you did the first half hour and the last half hour. Right. And we're going to focus on the second, the last half hour because there were a lot of structural things you did and a changes lot. for clarity. Right. The first half hour was pretty straightforward and tremendously fun to cut, I have to say. Establishing like BB 8, establishing Ray, esta you know, that was just tremendous. Uh, establishing Finn and um, Poe. Um, the last half hour was a lot more <laughs> work. Um, there were just some structural problems. Um, let's see, what do I want to tell you before? Some yeah, things maybe to look out you for. You know, I was, I was even wondering, I don't know if you think this is, would be interesting, but do you think it'd be interesting to talk about the changes you made well, I, before what, they... Maybe, I mean, yeah. the, 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 um, there's a, a mission, kind of a mission scene that, comes in before this, where they decide, it, like it's Leah and all her generals and Poe and Han and everybody, just trying to figure out what the best thing to do is. That the, um, 
the uh, First Order, the bad guys, have this weapon, this new weapon, and it's charged by the sun with the help of this huge oscillator, and it can take out whole planets, solar systems, whatever, and they've already taken out like the seat of government for the resistance, and their next target is, this, is the resistance fighters base. So they had figured out that they've got to get, they're gonna send Han, Finn used to work there, Finn is a, used to be there, he is a, a first, a, Ex First Order stormtrooper that defected, and he's now with these guys. He, since he used to be there, he and Han are going to sneak onto the planet, and and Chewie, and they're going to find some way to lower the shields. And then once they've did, done that, Poe and the X-wing fighters are going to come in, and they're going to bomb and destroy the oscillator so that this weapon is wiped out. However, <laughs> the sequence of of events was so complex. I mean, I could, I have this list that I was gonna read you of what the sequence of events is, and maybe it is worth hearing what it was before you see the, I'll have to see if I can find it here. Yeah. But the other thing is specifically, like, things you did to clarify that they yes. can look for. You can look for, I mean, the clip. you definitely should look for, we, there were also just, the mission was not clear. Something would happen in, like, for example, we now show, it, as, it is, as it is in here, we show the pilots bombing the oscillator and we show that it didn't work. In the, in the original structure, the pilots bomb the oscillator, there's a shot of the oscillator, and then we cut away. And it's like, well, did it work? Didn't it work? Um, why are we cutting away? Why aren't we completing this part of this beat? And we just had a lot of that kind of thing. And we had a lot of things that were assumed to be clear by the visuals that I personally thought needed to be stated. They just weren't clear enough. So I don't know. I don't know whether this is fun or not. But I'm sure it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this this clip starts with this moment when it's right after Han and and Finn have forced General Phasma to lower the shield. So. The first thing we see is this moment in the, at the re resistance base where one of the technicians reports to Leah, General, the shields are down. Then we used to see Poe and the, and the X-wing fighters go to light speed heading for the Starkiller base. Then we used to have a, a scene where some stormtroopers and Kylo Ren searched the Millennium, Fa Millennium Falcon and then the stormtroopers reported to Kylo Ren that there's no one on the Millennium Falcon. Then we saw the X-Wings drop out of light speed, and we heard Poe, you'll see this line here, almost in range, hit the target as many times as you can. We'll see that bit still in there. Then when they came into view, we saw a shot of Kylo Ren just seething on seeing the X-Wings, they've dropped out of light speed and now they're, vi they're visible and he sees that they're coming. Then we cut to a scene in the control room of um, Huck seeing the X-Wings coming and he still does this. He turns around and orders all of the TIE fighters into the air to fight them. Then we had a scene where all the TIE fighter pilots were scrambling around <laughs> on the airfield trying to get into their, into the, uh, into their, their ships. It just went on and on, and then, and then we saw, we went back to the pilots who had bombed the oscillator, and it's in the meantime like five or six things have happened. Where's the unity? Where's the continuity? It, it's a, it is definitely a sequence that has to be intercut, but it doesn't have to be intercut that much, and that's something that I've learned. Intercut, I think, too much breaks. There are too many breaks. Like, you have to, and I remember we were kind of laughing about it because we felt like we had learned, the, that learned that lesson with the intercutting on, on the first Star Trek. And I remember saying to him, didn't we learn this already once before that we can't do this much intercutting? You know, and, um, but anyway, let's take a look and we can talk. No, but yeah. I oh, just want to say, in the yeah. clip, so when... You'll see, yes, you'll yeah, see. Yeah, the oscillator, he said, you said you were lucky because you had um, 
was it? Th this is where the alien. Yes, there were. I just I, sometimes the I. The dog like alien yeah, says, but no, no damage. damage. <laughs> no damage. Well, you can't really see the mouth, which no, is the beauty of it. So you, oh, you, you can put in, you can but put no in his mouth. And there were other things where we put in. You, you'll no doubt, now that I've told you that we had to do this, you will spot the moments where there's like off camera dialogue before we cut to the character, and then the character continues the line. In almost all these cases, the off-camera dialogue, which kind of sticks out like a sore thumb, I'm sorry we didn't do a better job of it, but it's just, it just had to be. The off-camera dialogue is, is a piece of information that we need. We need yeah. for clarity. So the part, and even this part, which um, it, something about where, what does Poe say? Something he says, he says oh, about the, the time. Yeah, it, it's to try to keep, keep the ticking clock alive. He, he, had, he had said he had the line, as long as there's sun, we have a chance. Right. Okay, what does that really mean? So before... So now he says off screen, remember when the sun is gone, that weapon will be ready to fire. So you yeah. had to add... But that. as long as there's sun, we have a chance. So, so just first, try the, to, the yes. one you need is off screen. And, the, yeah. and then we cut into the one sort of trying to connect those two. So it's, it's, it's just a lot of little stuff but like But you'll this. see those two little things, the dog-like alien and Poe's line in right. this clip. And there's also a line of Hans, uh, which we could talk about. Uh, the, the, when the, after the, f well, I don't want to throw too much at you before you see it. I'll, I'll explain this one out. <laughs> we can run the clip. You are all very generous. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Wasn't there a whole fight with the, um, Snowmobile. Yeah, I was going to talk out. about that too. We took out a bunch of events later in this uh, sequence too. I guess I forgot to say that the third part of that plan was to rescue Ray. But I, I hope once they got the shields down, then there, there's Han and Finn and Chewie w were after Ray's Ray's rescue. Um, so when they got, once they got her back, we had that shot of them. Uh, we had the shot of the X wings fighting. And or at the X-wings and the Tie Fighters, the, the the battle above, and then we pan down and we see them coming out. And as scripted, Han's first line was, "My friend's got a bag full of explosives. Let's use them." And then, the dialogue that followed was something like Finn saying, "But the the oscillator's the only target, and there's no way in." And then Ray saying, "Yes, there is." I've been inside these walls. The mechanics are, simpler, are, are similar to the Star Destroyers. If you get me to a junction station, I can, I can open the blast door. <laughs> and it just was like, why do I need to know this? You know? And I think this is a case of the writers feeling that they need to explain what's, how she, why she's able to reach in and pull that piece of equipment out. But we've already seen her doing that kind of stuff. Earlier we saw her fixing you know, she's never been on the Millennium Falcon before, but she d knows how to fix it better than Han does earlier in the movie. So she was supposed to, they were supposed to split. Oh, so first of all, we added that line of Han's as they're running out. It's also a, p a line of ADR that I feel makes me cringe a little bit every time I see it. But he s looks up and he says, our, our guys are in trouble, we can't leave. So it makes it clear that what they're g they feel they have got to do something to help them. Or at least I hope it makes it clear. So they split up. They say they're going to go into the oscillator, and, and or they're going to set up to go into the oscillator. And I, I mean, I hope that it, it's Im implied that, um, I mean, I don't know, for the life of me, I don't know why the line had to be, my friend's got a bag full of explosives. I don't know why it couldn't have just been, hey, Chewie here brought, brought explosives with him. I mean, I, it, to me it's oblique and a little maddening, but that's all I had on camera. So <laughs> we cut out all the rest of the stuff, and we just cut to them trying to make their way into the building, and we just cut to, to Ray and Finn running into that junction station and her pulling that piece out. Do we have to know why she, how she knows how to do it? We've seen her doing all kinds of stuff that she magically knows how to do through the rest of the movie. And we cut out the snow speeder chase and them stealing a snow speeder and then being chased by these other snored troopers in a snow speeder. And it, it, just, it just went on too long. And there were so many events between when they split up from Han and Chewie 
that by the time you got there, you kind of forgot what their mission was. It just, there's just sometimes a certain point where, where less is really more. You, yeah. you just don't need all the steps. And too many endings and too many things that you have to get to. That's right. That end. Right. Um, we did have a lot of endings in this movie. A lot of endings. <laughs> Um, the next clip is interesting. This is also, it is the lightsaber fight, but there was, I wanted to first talk to you about, it was always intended to be split up. The yes, the, 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 the Finn saber fight was always uh, designed to be split up from the race saber fight. It wasn't designed to be split up exactly there, but it was, it was always meant to be, it, it, the, way it was, the way it ended up being, she fights him a little and then we cut away. And it was basically because I did not have, you know, they, they do, they shoot fights in beats, but they, al they don't always overlap the beats. So sometimes you do not have a way to get from the first beat of the fight to the second beat of the fight. And I had a real problem. So we moved, we moved the, uh, the split off. But the, the, the one thing that is interesting about that is as originally scripted, Poe and the fighters destroy the oscillator. Oh, there's a, there's a line where, by the way, it's not in this, but one of the pilots looks down after the explosion inside the oscillator w with Chewie's, he, he, they, they lay out Chewie's explosives all over the oscillator, create this explosion, and then one of the pilots looks down, this was an ad, and says, there's a brand new hole in that oscillator, which again, we're trying to make more connections, like, okay, what Han and Chewie just did has allowed our fighters now, our, our, our X-wing pilots now, to actually bomb inside and take out this oscillator that powers this vicious, vicious weapon. So that was another, just a million little things that needed to be added to try to make all of the pieces of the plan come together. But uh, we did have this th this bit where Poe and the and the um, X-wing fighters destroyed the oscillator before any of the saber fight actually started, and that felt weird. That he was abandoned, that he wasn't... Well, like, yeah, he had that line, our job is done here, let's go home. And he, so he's flying off feeling pretty good, and in the meantime, our two, our heroine and hero, are left with the most evil villain in the whole piece, and it, it, made, it made them feel a little heartless, the pilots, and it also made it feel like their job wasn't, their job mustn't be very hard if they're finished and ready to go before the, the big villain has even been taken out. So we moved everything down. So what, what you won't see, because we're showing the second half of the lightsaber fight, what, yeah. what now preceded what we're showing is the, um, is Poe now leaving. Yeah. He, he, it would, if we were showing more, it would be then the Millennium Falcon takes off with Poe uh, with Finn and Ray, and then we would see Poe saying, oh, I, s I see him, I've got eyes on him, off camera line, and then our job is done here, let's go home, and uh, the Millennium Falcon and all the X-Wings fly off to get, not X-Wings, I'm sorry, no, X-Wings, yeah, fly off uh, toward the resistance base together so that everybody's having a victory at the same time. Kind right. Of. You said originally you had um, when he's has her up against the cliff. It was all slow motion after from that point on. Uh, it was, there was more sl slow motion. I think it was kind of. I had more. I think I had as soon as she gained control of the fight. I had more slow motion. But I like it this way. I mean, I think I, I don't have a problem with. But it, it was interesting what you said. Then then JJ said, "Let's try it without slow motion." And then it finally ended up. She sort of thrusts a few times, and then when she has. This sort of killer thing, right, right, right. then it becomes, and that's that's really great. I love the slow motion. I love, Adam just he sold it so great. I mean that those those stumbles back and all of that stuff. He's I I love his. his and work. I love that you talk about the saber fight like a conversation. Like fights yeah, are like a conversation. Is. I mean I think that that fight is is it is almost like a dialogue scene between them. I mean he is. We see all of his uh, character qualities in that moment. That at first he is, he's sure he can do it, and then, especially at the, in those moments where she, she is in the film, only just begun to realize that there may be this thing inside her that she doesn't even fully recognize yet. But she, uh, when he says that thing, I can show you the ways of the force, and she decides to try to do again what she kind of pulled off with him earlier in the movie, and. Uh, 
he watches her do it, and at first he's, he doesn't even know what she's doing, and then you see those changes going, going on in him. By the, third, by the third piece, he's a little worried. You know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and I think that they are, having, they are kind of having a dialogue scene almost. And it goes back to what you said at the beginning, which is it's all about character and psychology, and it's an action scene, but it's all... It's, it still should be doing something besides being a saber fight. She'll be around. <laughs> Talk to Thank you. you so much. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs>